Apologies uh, to our Facebook Live audience for a little gremlin at the beginning. I can confirm now we are live on Facebook, so welcome to those of us joining there, uh, as well as uh, those in the room. Uh, to briefly introduce our panel, not that they need much introduction, Sir Simon Wesley to my right, I'm sure most of you know, President of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Miranda Walpert to his right from UCL, Ezra Sousa from Columbia University in New York, and mental health blogger to my left, Megan Haste, um, if you want their biographies further, uh, they're all in the program. And a reminder, now that we are live on Facebook, that you can have your say on Twitter using the hashtag MQScienceMeeting. Um, I'd like to open by asking the panel, uh, two years ago, an editorial in the, in the British Journal of Psychiatry described psychiatric diagnoses as impersonal, imperfect, and important. I'm going to use that as the starting point and address each of those uh, points in turn. Can I ask the panel how they respond to uh, the charge that all a diagnosis does is to reduce human experience down to, to a label? Uh, and maybe clinicians feel that once somebody's got a label, they've done their job, and there's no need to, to dig any deeper into a person's individual circumstances. I'm just still, still uh, dwelling on the thing live on Facebook, words I never thought I'd ever say. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. It's terrifying. Uh, well, you need to get out more. <laughs> you definitely need to get out more, because you really do. You it's often said. Go and see what people are actually doing, what doctors do. I mean, I mean already as we start off, you, you can, you know, whenever we have these discussions, and uh, you, I usually alert the local fire brigade because the room's going to be full of burning straw men before we get much further, and that's already started. The diagnosis is just the start. It's the way that we start. It's the way we begin. It's the way we do it across medicine. There's absolutely nothing different about psychiatry to the rest of the medicine. Diagnosis is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. But without it, you'd be struggling. And when you think about it, if we didn't have something like that, there would be no point in any of us doing any training. If every single person was genuinely, utterly, and completely different, why have I wasted 10 years at medical school? You wasted 12 years doing clinical psychology because there would be no point to it. And as soon as you find something that unites different people that you see, okay, that you could therefore bring knowledge from other people that you've seen, whatever it may be, you're on the way to having some form of diagnosis as a shorthand for experience. Without that, there would be that my grandmother would be just as good a doctor as me. Well, she's probably a lot better at doing it. <laughs> probably the worst example I could possibly have chosen. Um, but that's all a diagnosis is. It's a way of bringing things together that tell you we have seen something like this before, and it means that when I say that it's probable that there may this way have gone on, and it's probable that this treatment may work or may not, I am using a category, I am using a diagnosis. Without it, medicine would come to an abrupt halt. Patients would be completely baffled when they went in to see any doctor, any profession at all. They would wonder what on earth we were about. Ezra, Simon was saying it's just a starting point, though. Uh, it's not an end in itself. I agree with that, but I think that it's not as good a starting point um, if we're allowed to talk about experience outside the United Kingdom here. Yes, absolutely. Okay, it's a starting point here, be a starting point in the United States. It's not always a good starting point because there are many cultures where the diagnoses that we use don't really, um, aren't really meaningful to the people that we give them to and that we communicate them to. Um, when you, um, let's say, just, just for example, you know, in some regions of Africa, if you, people go um, usually first to traditional healers who tell them what their condition is in terms that, that they understand, in terms of their own cultural idioms. If you instead say to them, let's say you have schizophrenia or you have depression, it doesn't really ring true to them. It, you need the diagnosis as a, as a way for Western professionals to talk to one another. You need diagnoses. But I don't think that um, it's always the best starting point for talking to, um, to, the, to the users, if you like, or the people who are coming to see you. And I think we've overlooked that um, ever since we started um, making diagnoses, and the ICD-11, which will still to come out you know, in a couple of years, will be the first time, actually, that, that diagnoses are based you know, on experiences across the globe. And we'll take that into account. 
Miranda, how good are we at, at explaining uh, 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 the diagnosis to, to service users? Is there some skepticism among some service users about diagnosis because what it actually means hasn't been explained to them very well? I think what we're poor at explaining is how poor the diagnoses are and how um, limited our knowledge is. So I don't disagree that we need categories, and I don't disagree that we need categorization. I think where we've lost our way a bit is being too focused on trying to understand cause and not enough focused on trying to understand prognosis and what can actually help. And I think there are potentially new ways of grouping people, patient populations or others, that might be much more focused on what's going to help you rather than what I understand as being the nature of your difficulties. And I think that's a conversation we've got to have with people through accessing services. And I think there is a need for a paradigm shift in relation to that. And Megan, it took you some time to, to receive a diagnosis. How did you feel before you were given a diagnosis? And how do you feel once you have one? Well, it took three years for me to get the diagnosis. And that was three years of not knowing what was happening. Feeling incredibly poor. Um, and also going through self-harm and suicide attempts. And being given a diagnosis, it, it was being given an answer, it was being given a name, it was a relief. Um, because it gave me a way forward with treatment without knowing what it is, how can you treat it? So for me, a diagnosis was just a relief. Uh, I'm gonna ask you first, Megan, and I'd like the feedback from, from the rest of the panel. So some people have argued that the diagnostic labels encourage patient passivity, that uh, once a patient uh, service user is, is given a, a diagnosis, a label, that actually they come to identify with that label mm -hmm. too much, and actually that could be a hindrance. Would you agree with that, or do you identify too much with, with that label that you've been given? Well, I'm not sure as I identify with it too much most of the time. I think we all have phases where we maybe become very attached to our labels and we think that that defines us and that's just what we are. Um, but I think with time you come to learn that it's not who you are and you can continue to live, live a life outside of mental illness. And bringing the rest of the panel about the idea of patients, service users, identifying with the labels that they've been given. So I think that the whole issue of labelling and how we name ourselves is not, it's like Simon said, it's not specific to mental health, it's specific to any of the labels we carry around with us. And I think it's up to us as a community how much you choose to define yourself by that label. What I've certainly heard from both parents and young people is diagnosis can be um, labels of forgiveness because they allow people not to feel blamed for what they're experiencing or feel uncertain or alone. And I think they can have very powerful, um, helpful benefits in that way. I just think that they that some of that is a sort of false certainty around what is going on. And I think we need to be careful about, in our desire to help people have an understanding and a thinking about things, not to then slip into saying that we've now absolutely clear this is this is a clear category and you're in it. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I mean, making a diagnosis is a bit like giving someone a drug. It can do harm and it can do good. And there's nothing in the world in medicine that always does good. And there's nothing in the world that does not have side effects, apart from homeopathy. But other than that, everything has side effects. And I certainly, in my clinical experience, see many people to whom being given a label, particularly when it comes with all sorts of bag and baggage about what you do, has been utterly destructive, completely destructive, far more dangerous, really, than in fact any drug I've ever prescribed. So, of course, there's massive harms to it. And there's also massive good, as Megan has said. It's not a neutral out. Okay? And it changes as well. And I think Ezra's point is just saying, there are different diagnostic systems, and certainly, uh, I just come back from Sierra Leone, and thank God they were good enough to go to a place that doesn't have a copy of DSM in the entire country, um, which is a great relief uh, to all of them and us. Um, but there, they have different ways of, of approaching their problems, but their diagnoses, they're just different. To go back to the cultural point, Ezra, that, uh, that you mentioned earlier and that Simon just mentioned, here in the West, we probably would have diagnostic labels for uh, conditions that, or behaviours that in other cultures wouldn't need a label, they'd be perfectly normal. Um, that may be true. I think that um, not all diagnoses are equal here either. Um, and I've always thought this, but you know, my recent personal experience has made it um, uh, a much, something much deeper for me that I understand better. You know, 
um, so, you know, about five years I've had um, a, a kind of fatigue syndrome. I, I, I don't know what to call it, but, you know, it's, there are different names for these things. Do you have to call it anything? Um, Does it have to have a name? Well, it's very difficult. Do you have to call it anything? Well, when, when you, you have to call it something for certain contexts. Like, when you, when you go to your employer and you say, I'm not able to, um, I'm not able to perform at the, at the level that I used to. Why, you know? Well, you can't just say, I'm tired, you know? I don't feel like it, you know? So I said, well, I've got this fatigue, and I, so I don't know why, you know? And it, it's very difficult. That's the kind of, um, I found that extremely difficult. I found it difficult to, um, a difficult situation to be in, to go and have to say that. I found that employers or whoever else I had to explain it to didn't really take it very seriously, didn't make accommodations the way they might have done if I'd said I had cancer or something, um, or maybe some other psychiatric diagnosis. And, um, but the worst part of it was inside myself, actually, that I myself, because I didn't know really what it was, although I, 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 I gave it that name because I didn't know what else to call it, it's, you know, but, you know, so I said, okay, I've got some kind of fatigue syndrome, um, but I felt all the time why? You know, this, it must be my fault in some way. Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? And um, I didn't have the power that some people have. This is something I learned. You know, some people can tell the story of their mental illness. It wasn't, didn't turn out to be a mental illness, but I didn't know that at the time. So some people can tell their story in a very convincing way. You know, I didn't have that ability, um, both because I felt I had to keep a low profile, keep my job and so forth, but also because I just didn't have the ability. You know, I kept trying, you know. And then just to, I found out later it was due to a virus which was identified and treated, and I got completely better. This after five years, you know, now I'm completely fine. But, and so now it's easy to tell the story. But during that time, the, the, the feelings I had inside me I found were, were really, really painful. I didn't know how to cope with them. Um, it, it wasn't as bad as I think. I'm not comparing it to like what people with, um, you know, with much more severe mental illnesses have, but it, it gave me some insight into, um, into how powerful that, that feeling can be and, and the kind of things that people can experience, you know. So that was a diagnosis that I didn't find helpful. Um, I don't know what I would have done without it, though, either. Uh, I'm going to move the debate on in a second. I just, I'm going to point to a, a poll that uh, the Mental Elf has done uh, amongst his uh, followers. 50% um, of people polled thought that a diagnosis was helpful, 22% unhelpful, and 28% said neither. So obviously the... Uh, the, ma the majority or half of the half of the mental health audience think that it's been helpful for them. Um, before we move on to to the next point, uh, does anybody want to uh, chip in on the on the issue of diagnosis being impersonal and, and labelling? Lady two thirds of the way back on the on the left. Well, I just wanted to play the devil's advocate of what you would do otherwise. Right, because that's a good thing. Like first of saying if it's helpful or not, what what are you going to say otherwise? Let's say you're a health professional, psychiatrist, psychologist, and um, you weren't allowed to use diagnostic criteria anymore. You weren't allowed to say to someone, "Oh, you're suffering from OCD or GAD," and then you would say, "Well, you're just a bit of a mess of these, you know, all of these criteria, 11% of that, 10% of that, 20 of that. And that seems pretty distressing to me as well. Can I, can I take that one? So, so I and colleagues have been working on trying to think about alternative, alternatives, and they've all got their pros and cons. 
But one way of doing it might be to think about saying to someone that with the sort of symptoms you have, the sort of problems you're having, they might be helped by these sorts of things. So we put you into this grouping, and the grouping would be called this way of helping you with these sorts of things, not that you are this person. So it would be much more, fo much more prognostic but focused, much more needs-led around what do we know can help you, regardless of how you got to there. So it would be a shift in the conversation away from trying to understand how you have got there and towards what we're going to do to move you away from the things that are troubling you. You might end up then diagnosing someone as having a deficiency in CBT. That would be the, that would be the logical implication of what you're doing. So saying. what you'd be talking about is needs-based grouping based. And so what we try to do is build one nice guidance, which, of course, a diagnosis based. So, so it, 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 is a, it is a tension at the moment. And part of the tension is because the research has been so based around diagnosis, it's quite hard to move us on in terms of thinking about what do we know about what really helps. But if we really, we might say you're at a clinic which sorts out with behaviour intervention. So you might say, yes, that what, you're, that what you need at this moment might be a behavioural intervention, regardless of the sort of range of difficulties you got here. So a bit like a fracture clinic, which does, you have all sorts of ways you've got a fracture, you end up in the clinic. All sorts of ways you've got a it's something that can be helped by having a behavioural intervention, you end up in the behavioural intervention clinic. So I don't see it as different in that way from what I see as being a move in physical health as well, away from a diagnosis-based culture. Simon, do you want to respond well, to that? Well, you're quite right. I mean, when you have a diagnosis of a heart attack, there are a million ways of getting there. But once you've got a heart attack, the ways of treating are really fairly standardised. Yes. But, but nevertheless, when I, when I fell skiing a year ago, the first thing I did do, I wanted to know had I broken... Uh, a particular bone which I had. I wouldn't have been very happy and said, I don't know what you've done, but I do know you need the, the cure as an operation. I think I might have said, first of all, well, why? But you might also not have been happy if somebody spent an hour discussing with you, well, why did you take that turn that way? Why, you know, why were you going on a black run? What is it about your childhood that put you on that run? But that, that's, we laugh, but that's what we're doing. Well, that's what we're spending our time doing. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> Lady at the front. Well, that's not what all of us are doing. Um, when we have, we're treating a patient with depression, we don't say you're a depressive. We say you have an illness. It's called depression. This is the clinical course. This is what we can expect. These are the various treatments. And for, if you were at the talk I gave just a while ago, 30 years later, we could predict blindly what that, the high rates in people who, came from families with depression. So that doesn't tell us about the mechanism, but it does tell us a lot about the clinical course and the clarity. And until we have something better, that's, that's not bad. And that's true for almost all of the psychiatric diagnoses that we have. It, we know the clinical course, there are specific treatments. Some of them are better than others. Thank you, uh, and I'm gonna to return to that issue of Diagnosis being the best we have at the end of the debate. So I w I'd like to hear your views on that. I want to move on to the, the second sort of topic point, the imperfect. Uh, another straw man probably for you, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the claim that diagnostic criteria are largely driven by opinion um, rather than solid, solid scientific evidence. Well, they're driven by lots of things. I and mean, as it was, you were slightly skating around why diagnosis is particularly important in American medicine, because without a diagnosis, you can't get treatment simply because your doctor isn't paid for it. Yeah. At least in Britain, you can see a GP for stress, uh, things like that. Um, but in the US, you can't. So obviously, there are very big drivers, commercial, industrial uh, drivers going on there. That, uh, and of course, very few people would defend having how many, 568 or what's it, what is it now? I don't, know, I don't know how many diagnoses are on DSM. They tell me that it's actually... That actually, the book's got, that actually the book's got smaller, but that's only because they're printing it on thinner paper. <laughs> um, but it's actually gone up. Um, so yes, um, of course, th there is those kind of drivers as well. And I think, I don't know, what are there? Maybe 15, 20 diagnoses in psychiatry, and most doctors use even less than yeah. that. Um, so I think we, we overcomplicated it, that's for sure, and very difficult to defend that. We also introduce dodgy concepts, uh, coffee drinking disorder, um, oscillators, and uh, talking back to your parents, that's in there, isn't there? Obsessive love of gun syndrome. Actually, that's not in there. I made that one up. <coughs> the one they should have. It's not that. In there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But all of those, you know, I think are sometimes done just to sell the book, to be honest with you. 
but that doesn't negate the whole purpose of diagnosis when it's done properly. And of course, it is backed up by research. Some PTSD was completely invented. It was made up on the back of an envelope by some activists. Turned out to be very useful. But the evidence came second after the diagnosis. Other diagnoses, and there are hundreds of them, have died and disappeared. So we change them. When the worst things change, they change. Edward, can I ask you to address, particularly with your American perspective, uh, the, the argument, and, and I would stress this is not meant to be an anti-psychiatry discussion, I don't think it is, but uh, some people will argue that the only people benefiting from diagnosis are insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies who've got a product as such. Um, and obviously with the American experience in insurance, that, that, that's a big issue. Do you want to just pick up on, the, on who benefits? Yeah, well, I, I actually am not anti-diagnosis. I just... And yeah, it, it is true that insurance companies need, well, maybe they don't need, but they use diagnosis. They're, they're required in the American system in order to pay for uh, mental health care and medical care in general. Um, so it may be partly driven by that, as Simon is saying. Um, but I think I, I think I, I couldn't say that we, we couldn't really advance if we didn't have a working diagnostic system. I wouldn't say that, um, I, I'm not gonna make a judgment about how good it is. We have to make it much better. And, it, and it's not sufficient in any way, you know, as a guide to treatments or, or, or what you should do to help people. But I think you have to have it um, as, some, as a starting point. But I think that it's a starting point. What I was trying to point out is that it's a starting point that for the person themselves, um, it, it, it can be very, it can be harmful, difficult to deal with, um, and we could have much better ways of communicating it. And, you know, not only doctors to patients, say, but um, societally. Megan, when you were given your diagnosis, you, you, you mentioned the sense of relief. When you started looking further into it, did you look, look at the clinical criteria or look at in more depth at, at the diagnosis you've given? Did you, did you say, ah, yeah, I see myself in this? Or did you think, actually, you know, this is a very broad category and I, I, I don't know, a key to put into your fighting? No, I, I would say that I did see a lot of myself in it, but then I'm not sure if I looked at the official list um, so much as other people's personal experiences um, and to see if I related to it. Uh, I think there's very much, there's a place for statistics and official lists and everything. But I think when you've received a diagnosis, certainly for myself, um, I very much looked for another normal person's experience um, for that feeling of not being alone. And you've got a, a captive audience here in the room. As a service user, what would you say to people who uh, treat uh, people like you uh, in terms of what, what your priorities are? What could, what could the, the, the doctors that you saw have done differently or better uh, in, in those early stages as you were, you were getting to grips with, with your experience and your diagnosis? Well, my first uh, came to work three times. Um, was an interesting experience, as I was told. Um, I was mocked throughout the first session because of my posture, because I had a habit of sitting with my arms folded, um, which I'm not sure how that was meant to help with uh, my anxiety. Um, that said, this was pre-diagnosis. Did you have bad posture disorder? <laughs> Presumably so. <laughs> um, and another post-diagnosis, another therapist went on to tell me a week before my 17th birthday, you're about to turn 17, you really ought to be growing out of self-harm. Which, again, rather interesting perspective. Um, and so I would probably say try to remember that you're speaking to a human being um, and... I think it can be easy to mistake anxiety for teen angst and depression to attribute to depression to hormonal changes in young people. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes it's far more serious. And in those instances, 
mopping from one isn't helpful, um, funnily enough, and telling them that they ought to be growing ahead of it clearly isn't helpful. That's right. Um, before we move on, I'd like to address the, the, the criticism that whoever wants to pick this up is, is, is welcome to, that the diagnoses tend to be negative. They're disorders. No one says you've got resilience order. Um, <laughs> we are defined, uh, and I would include myself in, in this, in this definition, we are defined by what's wrong with us rather than what's right with us. Well, I mean, yes, of course, that's correct. I mean, you, when you go to see a doctor, you don't go to see a doctor because you're feeling happy, well, and everything's going fantastic in your life. You go because something's gone wrong. Um, and, and of course, therefore, it gets defined. We don't, doctors don't, don't go around having a diagnosis of beautiful people. That would look really weird and strange or smug bastard or whatever. We don't, that's what we do. Yes, we're, I mean, we're unequivocally in the illness business. Um, and therefore, that is what, that's what we do. I, I, but I think that's an interesting point because I think the whole happiness agenda and well-being agenda has has blurred whether we are in the happiness business or whether we're in the the illness business. And I, and I think there is a real issue here about resource and funding and what people are coming into it for. I'm not in any doubt that we're in the illness business. I really am not. I mean, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with all those other things. But I, I do think that's what we do. Um, although, I mean, if it, it gets otherwise quite facile, I'm going to be in the, in the unhappiness or happiness business tomorrow, depending on what happens to the football team. But I don't think I need professional help for that. But when I'm ill and I know what illness is, then I would, that's when I would go for professional help. And that's, that's why we get paid. That's why we get trained. That's why we have certain privileges in society that we do in, in our professions, both of us and everyone else in, in the professional world here. It's because we're there to help people who are in trouble of some shape. Or and do you think? Illness. And do you think all the people? That, I didn't use the word disease, by the way. I did use the word illness. But do you think all the people that come for a mental health professional are ill? Um, in that I, term, they they fit the category of illness. Much, pretty much for a psychiatrist, yes, I do. The people who come to see a cardiologist are ill. Yeah, they may not have a disease. That's a slightly different thing. And there are lots mm -hmm. of people who have diseases and are ill. But illness as a state of ill health, yes, I do think. So children that are brought to a psychologist or psychiatrist because the parents are unable to control their behaviour, they're ill. Well, they're in need of help. or someone well, in the, someone well, When in you go back into a need of help, you're into my categorisation system. Somebody, somebody, when you're in ill, you're in your categorisation system for the purpose that, of this debate. Somebody in that situation is mm -hmm. clearly, I mean, doing quite well, and also I deal with transmitted illness as well, but very clear that the child isn't ill at all, it's somebody else there. But there's still something wrong that is not about normality. It is not about, you know, different expressions of ways of living. It's about what I would define as an illness. And, and again, and which I have expertise in. Right. And so again, a young person that had been abused and was extremely distressed, that would be an illness in order to see a psychiatrist. It would be the start of a process of an illness that would then detect abuse and which would then detect the correct intervention. Um, Suzanne Schweizer? in the room. Suzanne, uh, thank you for giving me the best word of the day uh, award for resilience order. Uh, and as a journalist, I always am on the lookout for the punchy sound bites and we are unequivocally in the illness business. Simon, you get on the evening news with that sound bite. Thank you. Uh, we've, ju we've just got over, <laughs> we've got just over five minutes left uh, and I want to allow plenty of time for comments and questions. So maybe I can open it up to the floor. Andre, we'll start with you because you're at the front. You just wait for the microphone for our uh, audience on Facebook. Thank you. I'm Andre Tomlin from Mental Health. I just want to pick up on the point about overdiagnosis. Um, we sort of touched on that, but we didn't do enough of that from my perspective. Uh, in the US, rates of ADHD diagnosis have skyrocketed in the last 20 years from about 3% to about 15%. What would you account, or how would you account for these dramatic changes? Ezra, do you want to take that one in? If you want to Double back on the last uh, point, then please do. Yeah, I think that um, diagnostic practice varies enormously across countries, across, pra across clinical practices, and so forth. And um, we're, we don't understand always time trends in diagnosis. And one of example is ADHD, another is autism spectrum disorder. We're not really sure whether 
I, I would say for ADHD, it probably is being overdiagnosed in the United States. Autism spectrum disorder, I would say it's being more widely recognized and it's, um, and it's actually increasing. Though, but those, you can't prove, we're not able to prove either point. But, but what, what you can know just by looking at the most basic statistics is that diagnostic um, practices vary, vary enormously and we don't always understand why. We can prove that. We've got Sally here. She can prove overdiagnosis because we know what the prevalence of ADHD is. It's around 2%. If 14% of people are getting that diagnosis, then by definition, that's overdiagnosis. You no, know, it depends how you diagnose it because they just, we just did a review of like 75 studies at all different kinds of rates of ADHD, but they were all related to the methods that were used to diagnose it. So they couldn't say there was actually um, a time trend in ADHD. So it's not as simple as that. Uh, in the time available, I want to take some more questions. Could I just have a show of hands with people who want lots of questions? We'll rattle through them as quickly as we can, and apologies in advance if we don't get through them all. Lady at the front. My name is Sam, and I'm a service user with my own mental health issues. Do you feel that a diagnosis of mental health helps to reduce stigma because it separates people who are just feeling a bit worried or having a bad day to people who actually have depression or anxiety or any other mental health condition? I think that it can help to reduce stigma um, when we have the right attitude about it. Um, that comes from being careful that we aren't using words like depressed to describe sadness and anxiety to use for feeling a bit worried. Um, I think we all have a duty to be careful about the language we're using, um, otherwise it, it can have a damaging effect um, on people with an actual diagnosis. Uh, next question. Towards the back, lady in the burgundy. Hello. Um, so I've always thought of um, mental health diagnosis as being a good way to access services. That's kind of a way I've always thought about it. But I think in the context of like current NHS, you have to be very high risk often to actually get help. Um, yeah, and in the context of what Sally McManus was saying earlier about treatment rates being higher in white women in their 30s, and also a recent UK report, I think, said that um, one of the lowest access group is young people to get service support. So I was just wondering what you thought about usefulness of diagnosis in the context of that gulf between diagnosis and treatment. Well, I think one of the interesting things for the NHS, and I think it's interesting when you talk about we're in the illness business, and I'm not a clinician now, so I refer to people who are at the clinical front line, Certainly in the NHS now, I think we're in the risk management business a lot of the time. And I think it's, a very, it's orthogonal to illness. And a lot of decisions about who can be taken on, who can be discharged, how long they'll work with, are all to do with risk and not to do with any sort of illness or therapeutic decision making. And I think that's a real problem and one of the complexities in how we think about how we're helping people. I'll take two more questions together before we have our closing thoughts. We are running out of time. Two, two hands, gentlemen at the front and... Sorry? Oh, apologies. Sorry. Uh, lady with the microphone and the gentleman at the front there. Okay. Hi, I'm Hannah from the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute for Mental Health. Um, it's not so much a question, more just a bit of food for thought, picking up on what Simon and to a certain extent Miranda were saying earlier, that yes, we're in a very, very fortunate position in the UK where we can go through the GP with anything. We don't need a diagnosis to come out of it. But if you think about children rather than adults in this instance and you think about the joined up care that the government is pushing to receive and uh, sorry the joined up care that the government is pushing for for that to be and you know statements have turned into education and health and care plans without a diagnosis children are very very unlikely to receive an education and health care plan which then stops them getting you know, the dedicated help and support that they need, especially within an educational establishment. So I just, you know, wanted to bring up that point that actually, I'm not saying I'm for a diagnosis. I think they can be good in some respects and, you know, detrimental in others. 
But at the moment, we're definitely in a system where we need a diagnosis. And Miranda, if you know, if you were in one of those team around the child meetings and you said, this child has difficulties that will benefit from behavioural treatment, they're going to say, so what? You do know, you think, you're not going to get anything. And do you think that that leads to, it's something that, that we haven't had a chance to discuss at, at great length, do you think that leads to in, increasing medicalisation of, of behaviours? Because unless you've got a diagnosis, you can't access services, you can't access support. I think that may be part of it, and certainly from my years of education, I've known parents that have said, I can't get anywhere, and medication is just the only way I can control my child or make it better for them. So, yeah, I think to a certain extent, so, I agree. So can, can I just Please. quickly go back to that? Because I think it's a really important point. Just so, you know, that's exactly the scenario that we're trying to address, and we have come up with this model of trying, how we might do that, how we might develop a language that would help us with that. So it's not that I'm not aware of exactly the issues you're talking about, but there are ways forward, so you can you can still have severity thresholds. You don't have to have a diagnosis to be talking about severity of certain uh, of certain behaviours or issues for people. It's about being more transparent about what we know and what we don't know, and not making an artificial cut off of saying, you know, if you're in this group, you're definitely in it. If you're out this group, you're definitely out of it. So I think we need to be honest. If, we, if it's about resource allocation, which it often is, then thresholds are necessary. But we need to think about how we, we police those thresholds in a reasonable way and in a way that's shared with people wanting to access services. Uh, brief question, if you would, from the gentleman at the front. Um, so perhaps a slight change of tack. Um, given the MQ focus on transforming mental health through research, I think one interesting thing in the literature, at least, coming from a non-clinician, is that you tend to see intervention studies, for example, that target a very specific mechanism of a disorder. I think working memory training was mentioned earlier on. However, again, we're then classing this group of individuals with ADHD as essentially all having working memory deficits when that's not the case. So perhaps um, targeting these very specific mechanisms, assuming that they're global across a particular disorder, isn't the right tag. So, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I, I think we're asking the wrong question completely. You know, I, I, we need diagnoses, whether they're those kind of diagnoses, the kind of diagnoses we have. It's what we do with the diagnoses and what society does with the diagnoses that is what it's all about. We've done terrible things to people with psychiatric diagnoses over the past hundred years. And now we're getting much better, but we, there's still a lot of exclusion, discrimination. There's a, a lot of things happen to people when they're given a psychiatric diagnosis that are really bad. And it happens inside them, and it happens, other people do it to them too. And we've got to face that. And we've got, and that's the big question to me. We've got to, we've got to find ways to make people feel included and to have their full civil rights. And that, that's to me the question. It's not, should we have a diagnosis or not? Can, can, I, can I come in here? That's okay, I know it's a big lot, but, but just in relation to that, I, I suppose I think that a lot of the stuff we've heard today has been really inspirational, interesting in its own way. But I, I you know, conflict of interest alert, I, I do think we need much more research on the messy reality of dealing with the complexity of people that come into services and they don't fit into any of these boxes at all. Um, and we know from our research that at least half of the population coming to mental health services don't fit neatly into nice guidance related um, uh, advice pathway. That's true in the States as well. You know, the, we, we, the messy reality people coming in deserve, and that's why until we move, I, I personally believe until we move away from diagnosis to think about what actually helps people. And I actually think your work is seminal on this. So, I mean, I think you, you may believe in the diagnosis, but what you're doing is exactly what should be done more generally in terms of thinking about evidence-based, prognosis-focused intervention to see what actually makes a difference. As MQ's focus is on research, uh, I did want to get onto the issue of what a diagnosis may look like 20 or 30 years from now. Uh, we haven't got time for that, unfortunately. Maybe, <laughs> maybe with Andre we can do a podcast uh, with, with some of the speakers later and, and put that up online. Uh, I'm going to have to draw things to a close. Apologies to the, to the next speaker for overrunning slightly. Uh, I think you'll agree it's been, uh, it's been worth it, though. Uh, please do continue the discussion using the um, hashtag MQ Science Meeting. Thank you to those of us, uh, those of you who joined us on Facebook. Please do continue uh, the conversation on Twitter. Um, and, but thanks to our panel, Sally McManus, who started us off, Sir Simon Wesley, Miranda Walpert, Ezra Susat, and Megan Hurt. Thank you very much. Well done.